Hey everyone, are you enjoying BackstageCon so far? Yeah. <laughs> wow! Come on, you can do better than that. You must say yeah, okay? Yeah. Are you enjoying BackstageCon? Yeah. There you are. Awesome. Thank you. <laughs> so, welcome to our talk titled From Click to Chaos Linking Argo Workflows in Backstage for Automated Testing. We're going to start with a quick announcement if we have it here. You can win this board game right now if you pay attention, all right? So on one of our slides, there's going to be a secret code. You're going to see the secret code and this email address again. So you don't worry if you can't write it down right now, backstagecon at neo4j.com. If you see the secret code, send an email to this uh, email address, and the first one to send it will have the board game. And we're going to uh, respond via the email. And I am Chris Heiss. I'm a former SRE. I'm currently a senior platform engineer at Neo4j. I'm also a proud cat dad. And if you're into rock music, you can also find me on Spotify's other famous software, the one that plays music as Chris Philip Hemingway. What a shameless plug. Over to Luke. Hi, folks. I'm a member of the enablement team alongside Chris at Neo4j, where I lead our backstage development. I've been working with backstage since around 2021 and mainly as a lurker in the Discord, so it's great to finally be here contributing something back to the community. In my free time, I'm a bit of a D&D &D and fantasy nerd. Now, this talk is going to talk a lot about Kubernetes, Argo workflows, and Backstage. You don't need to be an expert in any of these topics to follow along. We're going to show you how you can do the same things we've done, either at your organization or in your pet project. Actually, before we move on, could you just tell us what Neo4j is, wink, wink? Of course, Chris. So Neo4j is a leading graph database technology company, and our software of the same name is a graph database. It's used for all sorts of things, from gen AI to fraud detection to real-time recommendations, and a wide variety of other use cases. If you'd like to learn more about how Neo4j is being used to plan NASA's mission to Mars, or how Neo4j is being used to support cancer research around the world, then we've included some articles on our slides. We come from the cloud engineering side of Neo4j, where we focus on our main product, Aura, which is Neo4j as a cloud-hosted service. And we offer databases running on Google Cloud, AWS, and Azure. And we manage over a 1,000 different Kubernetes clusters for our customers. Now, with Neo4j constantly receiving new features and with all of these clusters that we need to maintain, we need to make sure that at all times, Neo4j is stable and performant. To this end, we've been creating some chaos tests that any of our developers can easily spin up to test the performance and stability of Neo4j. The simplest of these simply runs a Docker container next to a running Neo4j database in a developer's environment and sends it a demanding query. We can then monitor the health of the database and of the underlying pods to see if it's not falling over. Now, in this talk, we're going to focus primarily on this simple use case, but most of what we're going to talk about can easily be applied to any sort of containerized chaos testing or load testing tool, as well as a variety of other use cases. That's right, and for the sake of this example, Let's just say that planet Mars is where our production environment is. And we send out new features, which is the rocket, every single day from planet Earth, where our developers live. Now, we could immediately do chaos engineering on our production environment. Well, chaos testing in uh, production is easy, right, Chris? Just say the word and we'll just do it. Yeah, sure. Why not? So what we would then do is we would create an Aura database on our production environment only for testing purposes and then by hand manually create a Kubernetes job as a first step. Uh, that would do two things. One container would run Cypher queries against the Aura database. Now, if anyone is not familiar with Cypher, it's basically SQL, but for graph databases, so much better. And uh, the next container would then check the pod's health in which the Aura database is running. You could add a bunch of randomized events there, you know, like uh, pot killed, whatever network latency injected, or create the database first. But we are going to focus on this somewhat load testy scenario for this example. And then once you do this, uh, you do create this Kubernetes job, you can then manually monitor it, right? But that's a lot of toil to create the job, think about all the use cases you want to go with, and then monitor it, and then 
Maybe it passed, maybe it failed, you don't know. It's very toily, especially when you work with over 100 Neo4j engineers. And by the way, many of them are not interested in Kubernetes because they might be non-platform engineers, non-cloud engineers even. I mean, not everyone is as lucky as we are, right? Some people have uh, families and stuff. Uh, also, we have, for example, um, mathematicians who are focused on algorithmic improvements on Neo4j. They don't care about Kubernetes. And we have a bunch of other group of people like, uh, I don't know, product managers who, well, God knows what they do. But the point is, not everyone feels comfortable working with Kubernetes. So let's take a step back for now and let's agree that we're not going to do production chaos testing for now. We're going to use the moon, which is an isolated development environment, non-reachable by our customers. And instead of manually creating the Kubernetes job, let's look for a framework that can template Kubernetes jobs. Now, we have been doing some research over a couple of weeks, and we found some great, absolutely great chaos engineering tools, but we decided to go with an unconventional method. We decided to use Argo workflows. You might say, well, yeah, but that wasn't created for chaos engineering. And you are right, but it happens to be a great tool for that. Let me explain. Oh, actually, before I do, we are also very familiar with other tools like uh, GitHub Actions, for example. And we still use GitHub Actions for use cases where we want to run stuff outside of Kubernetes, even outside of uh, GCP, Azure, or AWS. The problem is, for this use case, is when you have over a 1,000 Kubernetes clusters to work with, like we do, and multi-cloud, you have to think about the authentication part, the network latency. So if you start running anything on GitHub Actions that needs to communicate with over 1,000 uh, Kubernetes clusters, you have to go through a lot of hoops. Argo Workflows, on the other hand, and think about it as a lunar base in this scenario, is a cloud-native, Kubernetes-native workflows engine for running parallel jobs. So it's very lightweight, easy to use. And if you run chaos tests from within the cluster, then if you think about it, the, the request never needs to leave the cluster in the first place. So the late network latency is going to be incredibly low. You don't have to worry about authentication because you, all, all you need is a service account with the right RBAC. So it's quick, easy. In this example, uh, this is just a basic uh, example that you see here. You can go as crazy as you want. You see that a workflow template is being created. Once you install Argo workflows in your cluster, Kubernetes will understand what a workflow template is. Think about it as a, as a VHS cassette, right? You create the template and you can replay it in the future over and over and over and over again. Although some of you are too young to know what a VHS cassette is. Uh, in this example, we're saying my name is cipher send query, it's on line four, and I'm living in the default namespace, and I need two incoming parameters in order to be able to run. And then the custom business logic starts on line 13. Uh, we are pulling down the official Neo4j cipher image to run cipher requests against the database in the hopes that we can break it. Now, if we were to only work with one single Kubernetes cluster, that would be the end of the story. But because, as we mentioned, we are using over 1,000 Kubernetes clusters, we also decided to build a very lightweight and efficient Go microservice, which has only one responsibility. The responsibility is to request something in, in form of a JSON. You can send a POST request to it. And uh, you define what Argo workflow template you want to run. And you also need to provide the parameters. In this case, that would be the bulk URL of the Neo4j uh, database and the Cypher query or the queries. And the actual implementation is actually really, really lightweight. You can see it on the screen. So basically, we are using the openly available SDK that any one of you can use. And you're saying, in this namespace, I want you to create this workflow, the workflow being a Go struct in this case. But of course, you can do it in any other programming language you wish. And basically, whatever the request gets, will be put into this struct and be uh, created in the uh, relevant Kubernetes cluster. Now, this microservice then knows which Kubernetes cluster to create the Argo workflow in based on the Bolt URI. And there's a summary from the backend. Uh, anyone can use this microservice within Neo4j to create any Argo workflows based on any workflow templates. They just have to provide all the necessary parameters 
And once that's done, everyone's happy and we can start finally do some... Oh no, uh, sorry, something is wrong with the slides. Why are the rockets sad? Well, Chris, none of these rockets can be launched. People don't want to send post requests from their terminals. What? I know, but people want an easy to use UI where they can go in and just click a button. Is there anything, anything at all we could do? What? It's behind ah, me. Thanks, madame. Well, if only we had a mission control where developers could manage all of their automations from a centralized location. Well, fortunately we do in Backstage. Now, we have a few engineers at Neo4j that mostly specialize in infra and kind of um, back-endy kind of tasks, and they're a little bit scared of front-end development. But fortunately, Backstage makes it super easy to integrate with our own services. And there's also a number of plugins available that do a lot of the heavy lifting for us as well. A special shout out goes to the Spotify back, uh, Backstage plugin bundle for giving us really good and easy R back and insights. We also love the kind of service control panels we get on components, and we're trying to encourage developers to use those more and more. Now, a core part of the Backstage offering is the scaffolder, and I'm sure many of you here have come across it before. But for those that haven't, the scaffolder is built as the way for engineers to easily create new software. And it lets platform owners define templates for uh, engineers to come in and create new software really easily. And it's a key part of how engineers at Spotify follow their golden paths. But let's look a bit more closely at the different features that it has available. So we can create reusable workflows made of, of as many composable steps as we like. We can also surface those workflows in the Backstage UI and allow developers to search through them really easily. We can also create complex input forms for those workflows as well and provide all manner of validation and link it all into the software catalog as well. When we get logs from our workflows as they run, we can also feed them back to the user all through the Backstage uh, UI. We also get workflow state tracking and also view of who owns a, a given workflow and who triggered it. And importantly for us, we can write our own custom steps in TypeScript. And so long as whatever you want to do can be done in TypeScript in the context of your backstage backend, you can kind of do whatever you want within the scaffolder. Now, this is starting to sound a little bit less like a code generation tool and a bit more like a workload automation tool. I'm sure there's a better technical term out there. Um, which kind of raises a bit of a question for maybe Stanley as to why it's called the scaffolder. Um, in fact, at Neo4j, we never refer to it as the scaffolder or as software templates. As far as everyone else at Neo4j is concerned, it's just referred to as Aura Actions, and that's what they know it as. Now, if we look at how this is useful for our particular use case, we have a lot of non-cloud engineers at Neo4j that want to kind of run our workflows from a single place. And we want to make sure that they have uh, kind of clear input forms that can make, we can make sure are totally foolproof. And that's all provided through the input forms. We also want to tightly control who can actually run our chaos tests, because even if we're safe to run them in production, we don't want just anyone coming in and running them at any time. And this is where the RBAC plugin from Spotify comes in really handy. On the off chance something goes wrong with our chaos tests as well, we want to be able to feed those logs back to the user. And again, we can do this with the scaffolder. And we want all of this functionality without building a brand new UI from scratch, and we want it quickly and cheaply. Luke, just a quick question. How do you even start this? So when you initially had to set up, what did you do? Well, it's super straightforward. So Backstage has some great docs on how to create a new module for the scaffolder. And if you follow the instructions in the docs, then it will tell you how to use the Backstage CLI to spin up a new module. You can then go in and replace the input schema with the input for your workflow, and then add the actual logic for calling out to your service. So if we look a little bit at how this looks like, so you can see within our module code on line four, we're just calling the create template action function, and then we're passing in an ID for our custom action. And you can see we're just following a similar naming convention uh, to the built-in actions within Backstage. And then we're just defining our input schema that we want our, work, our customer action to follow. Then you have the actual business logic for your custom action. Now in ours, it's quite straightforward. It's calling out to an API, same as you would in any other context. And then you can see towards the end on line 38, 
we're just using the output function on the context object to pass the logs back to the user. So all quite straightforward. I got to say, it's incredibly easy to use the, the whole uh, scaffold, and I'm really glad with it. Uh, just to give you a quick sum up here, uh, Backstage sends out this post request to the microservice we previously mentioned, and as long as the JSON payload follows the structure that we expect, it will be able to find the relevant Kubernetes cluster and spawn up the Argo workflows in the relevant cluster. Now, for future reference, and this is where it gets exciting, and we are getting uh, to the end of the presentation, so I'm going to keep it short. But our next stop is going to be production. Testing on production is always really useful. And also, we have already opened up the possibility for Neo4j engineers to create custom actions that they wish to see, or custom use cases. And this is where the random events come back, which are very important. And probably many of you think, when you think about chaos engineering, you think about like a Kubernetes uh, pod dying or a cloud resource going away or a deployment scaled down, network latency spiking, whatever. All of these random events can be implemented with the same uh, method that we showed you earlier. Now, one of our final goals, or maybe not final goals, but one of the big missions that we want to uh, deliver is to be in a situation where we hire someone at Neo4j, and at the end of their induction period, they could go to backstage, click on a button, and say, I want to test my knowledge. And that would create a completely new and very complex Argo workflows where a Slack channel would be created. The engineer would be brought into that Slack channel, progression on there. Uh, so basically what would happen uh, would be some random chaos would happen against an, an Aura database, and the engineer would need to fix that. And they can basically test their knowledge and their response time as well, whether they are capable of, for example, going on call if they decide to, which is not mandatory at Neo4j, by the way. So really exciting uh, events are on the horizon, including these automated fire drills. And I think that was everything that we wanted to say today. Yeah, I think it is. If you wanted more details about what we've been up to with this, then we've written an article which you are welcome to read. And we're happy to take some questions if anyone has any questions. I assume everyone's on their phone sending that email. We shouldn't have timed the applause uh, to that, but whatever. <laughs> cool. Well, oh, sorry. One minute for questions, I just heard. No questions. All right, thank you very much for your attention. Cool. The Neo4j booth will be around all week if you want to come and talk to anyone from Neo4j. Um.